All right, now that I'm recording. So um, just a number of small random topics. We've gotten through the big stuff already, um, but we're just gonna kind of go through some miscellaneous cleanup type stuff. And then um, if everybody is taking intermediate two in the spring with Amy, you guys will continue on with chapter 12 in that class. And uh, I think you'll enjoy her. She's super funny and engaging probably more so than I am. So you'll enjoy the change of pace, I'm sure. Um, so as far as COVID-19 and financial reporting, um, there was a lot of different businesses that were affected in their operations. Either they had to temporarily cease operations or paused or some places went out of business, but there was um, in a lot of different businesses, they had dramatic reductions in cash flows um, related to their customer services. And so then that leads to a situation where you maybe have like a lack of comparability as far as um, what your financial statements might be from one year to the next. Now, um, because you have a lack of customer cash flows, that could potentially also affect your fixed assets if they are not going to be producing the same level of cash flows for you that they previously have. Um, so GAP requires, though, that when you're testing for impairment, generally it has to be a situation where it may not be recoverable. So as far as fixed assets go, um, you would need to do that same impairment test that we talked about where you first look at the undiscounted cash flows to see uh, for the future of that um, equipment. And then, um, and then you'd be looking at the, you know, the whole life of the asset, not just your use of it, but also what you can get for it at the end. So in order for that to be impaired, the asset would need to not just not be operating, but it would also need to potentially lose value during the time, you know, as far as like resale value. One second, I'm going to close the door here. It's a little. That's nice. Thing. Loud. Okay. So, um, COVID-19 was a huge triggering event. Um, so companies would have had to, you know, at least consider whether there was a potential for impairment of their uh, fixed assets during that time. Um, if they if they lost customers temporarily or long term, that might lead to um, potential long term lack of profitability in the organization. So if you think about intangibles and goodwill and stuff, that would be a huge thing that would potentially be affected more so probably than the actual property and equipment, which might just be kind of sitting there idle. Um, but when whenever you have like a major world event like that, that's affecting markets and um, large swaths of business, that would be a potential event to consider testing for impairment. So anytime there's more circumstances that indicate a significant shift in your business, you would want to um, consider um, whether your indefinite life and tangible assets, like things like patents, trademarks, et cetera, are potentially losing value. Um, and they would probably start that off not by necessarily going directly to numbers and the undiscounted cash flows, because that can be sort of a costly um, and unpredictable um, thing to do. They'd look at it qualitatively and say, like, realistically, is this going to affect our business long term or is this a temporary blip? You know, what um, what are the actual effects here when we think about it from a common sense um, situational standpoint. And then if, you know, if, if they think that there's going to be long-term losses, then they would maybe go and start looking at that impairment testing, um, looking to see at the undiscounted cash flows, the recoverability test. Okay. And then again, so first you look at the undiscounted cash flows to see if there is, um, um, a recoverability, a bill, you know, if, a loss in recoverability. And then if there is, then you would say, okay, is the fair value less than the book value? If it is, then you would recognize the impairment loss. Okay. Now, um, what are some of the differences between IFRS and GAAP? 
So under GAP, you can choose to first do that qualitative assessment um, to figure out if there is a likelihood of impairment. Um, under IFERS, um, they actually just test it annually regardless if it's a, a indefinite life other than goodwill. All right, um, and then as far as valuation, the impairment loss under GAP is the difference between book and fair value. And then under IFERS, it's the difference between the book value and the recoverable amount. So that is a big difference. Uh, under GAP, once you mark it down in value, you cannot mark it back up. However, under IFERS, if you mark it down and then the circumstances change such, such that there is not actually an impairment, like you were wrong, um, then you would mark that back up to value. All right, so uh, now let's talk about goodwill. All right, goodwill, we talked about how that's generated. Um, it's kind of unique in that um, you can't, you don't necessarily like allocate money to goodwill when you're buying something, right? You're not gonna be like, I'm gonna go buy some goodwill. It doesn't work that way. You have to buy like a whole business um, or a, you know, a set of assets and, um, and then they have to have some intangible value beyond the list of assets that you're purchasing. And so you can't really separate it from your company as a whole. You can test it at reporting unit levels. So let's say you buy like a business segment, or if you buy another small business and incorporate it into your business, um, and then it's its own little you know, sub reporting unit, like a department within your overall business, you can have it that way, but, um, but you can't separate it from that unit, so to speak. And then um, from a definitional standpoint, they define a reporting unit as any operating segment or a component of an operating segment where they have separate, where you can actually define separate financial information that is segregated from the rest of the whole. Okay, so basically like, okay, we can say we have these stores in this unit and they sell these products in this unit. And these are the costs and the revenues that are associated with this particular unit. And we can define those separately from the rest of the operating units that we have. Now, as far as goodwill, figuring out impairment, um, you have to look at what is the book value. So um, the net book value after you've done any depletion, amortization, depreciation of that reporting unit, um, you compare that with um, the actual current value. And then if the fair value of the reporting unit is less than that book value, then we would mark down the goodwill. Um, so basically the impairment loss that you have is the amount that your fair value is higher um, than your book value, but um, that should be the fair value would be lower than your book value because you'd have an impairment gain, I would think, if the value was higher which you would recognize an impairment gain. So I think it's a typo there. Um, but you can't, um, you can't have a loss that's greater than the goodwill. So you can't mark down the other assets if the value of the um, unit goes farther. You just would mark it down to just the value of the assets and say, okay, there's no remaining goodwill value here. So if we had, um, if we had a net book value of the assets, let's put A for assets, of uh, 1 million, and um, we had a fair value of the um, overall unit. Uh, so we had net book value, the assets of 1 million, and then we'll say the goodwill, the separate asset, was um, 300,000 for a total book value of 1.3 million. If our fair value was only 1.2 million, then we would write it down. We'd write down the goodwill down to 200,000 to get this to the 1.2 million. And then if this was, let's say that the fair value was only 900,000 because our we weren't depreciating things as uh, quickly as they were dropping in value, um, we would just write this down to the 1 million of the remaining assets. We can't go any further than just 
wiping out that whole well. Okay, let's see here. So looking at um, problem number 13 then in our in-class exercises should be a goodwill write-off. Um, also, if you're testing goodwill at the same time as other assets, um, you would test the other assets first and then any impairment losses and asset write-downs would be recorded prior to testing your goodwill. So you've already written those down. So it's a totally separate test, okay? And then theoretically, you know, you should be, you shouldn't have that situation where the assets are worth less than the fair value in theory, if you do that first. But if you do for some reason, um, then you just would go down to the net book value of those assets. All right. And then again, you can't reverse it if you do it and then the value goes back up later. So you got to make sure when you're considering this from a qualitative standpoint that you've said, yes, this is actually a permanent loss of value, not a temporary loss of value. And you could argue that a lot of the stuff under COVID, unless a building like lost a whole bunch of their employees that were like critical to their goodwill and their um, knowledge production or something, like if you were Tesla and you lost all your engineers, that would be problematic in the long term, as opposed to like people just not buying your cars for two years. All right. Okay, whoops, come on. There we go. So pulling up problem 13, um, it's just a really, it's a, it's a goodwill um, impairment problem. Nothing super crazy about it. Hopefully, oh, by the way, don't forget that chapter 11 homework part one is due today. Chapter, uh, the part two is due Sunday. All right, and then we got through problem 12 on the other videos that I posted out there. Okay, so we've got um, web helper, which in, uh, well, web helper acquired 100% of the uh, stock, holy cow, I can't talk, from Silicon Chips Corporation for 45 million, of which 15 million was allocated to Goodwill. And then at the end of the fiscal year, an impairment test revealed that the fair value of that company was 40 million and the book value of the assets was 42 million, okay? So uh, we've determined that overall the company has gone down in value. Um, so we had, uh, we had total value of, um, let's see, so 15 million was Goodwill, which would mean how much of it was other assets if we purchased it for 45 million. 30, 30 million, right? Yeah. So total of 45. All right, now, now we have a fair value at, after another year of uh, only 40 million, right? And then we have um, a book value of 42 million. Okay, so what we would say then is that, so the book value including Goodwill was 42 million. So in this case, um, we if we had 30 million in other assets, we're looking at a write down, an impairment loss here of how much? because the fair value is less than the book value. Two million, right? Um, and because we have um, 30 million in other assets, we have quite a bit of goodwill that we can burn off there. Um, and then theoretically, we would have already tested those other um, assets to make sure that they're still worth, you know, enough. But um, yeah, so we would just take the, the impairment loss of two million. 
The only time you would need to worry about it is if you're looking at potentially having to write down below that 30 million of the other assets. And then you'd kind of need to know the difference. You'd need to know what the net book value was of, the, of those specific assets to make sure you're not writing them down below their book values. Okay. So let's see here. So here's some different companies that have taken goodwill impairment losses over time. So it's not unusual. These are all really large public companies. Um, it's not unusual for uh, companies to end up with goodwill losses, particularly if they are purchasing different business segments and consolidating them in, which, a lot, you know, Microsoft, they might buy like a niche software company and bring it in. Same thing like... Um, all of these are, are companies that would potentially be buying other units and diversifying into other industries and or expanding into new markets by purchasing competitors and stuff like that. So um, along with that, they're almost always going to have some different business units that would have uh, goodwill associated with them. Okay, and then here's an example of a disclosure for um, Carnival Corporation. Now, um, so Carnival, I wonder if this is Carnival Cruises. Let's see. So as a result of COVID-19 and our expected future operating cash flows, we performed interim discounted cash flow analyses for certain reporting units with goodwill as of February 29th, 2020, and for all reporting units with goodwill as of May 31st, 2020. During the six months ended May 31st, 2020, we determined that the estimated fair values of our North America and Australia segment reporting units and two of our Europe and Asia segment reporting units no longer exceeded their carrying values. Carrying values is another way of referring to book value, by the way. We recognized goodwill impairment charges of 1.4 and 2.1 billion during the three and six months, et cetera, and have no remaining goodwill for those reporting units. So cruise line industry was a huge one that was really hit during COVID-19. And they, um, and uh, there was a lot of like loss of not just revenues during that time, but also like people really changed their travel habits for the long term. And cruise lines suddenly like the image of it being like this wonderful, easy, carefree way of going on vacation suddenly became like, oh, or you could go and get trapped on a, in a little tiny, you know, eight by eight room surrounded by disease, right? So <laughs> huge shift in, in long-term perception um, for them. Okay. Um, now, as far as differences between IFRS and GAP for impairment of goodwill, um, you need to test under GAP at the reporting unit level, which I talked about. And then under IFRS, they refer to them as cash generating units. So um, it can't be lower than a segment. So uh, they require you to go all the way down to the segment level under GAP, whereas under IFRS, you could potentially have your cash generating unit be larger, more broad than an actual small segment if you wanted. Um, and then um, similar kind of treatment there. Let's see here. Um, and I already talked, it seems like a duplicate here. Oh, this is specifically referring to goodwill. Um, GAP requires companies to test goodwill for impairment whenever an event occurs or circumstances change, indicating that more likely than not, the fair value has fallen below its carrying value. Okay, so that more likely than not is sort of a key phrase whenever you see something like that triggering then you need to say like, okay, if they come in, they say that there is a 49% chance that there would be long-term impairment. Would that be more likely than not? Probably not, right? So 49% chance of impairment is less than half. So it has to be more than half um, to be more likely than not. So if they refer to percentage likelihood, um, just keep that in mind. Um, and then potential, like if they said you could possibly extend that out into that. Remember when we were looking at expected value calculations where you might have like three different possibilities with different probability levels, like you might have a 
20% chance of a 10% drop in value or a 40% chance of a, um, let me actually, I'll show you what I mean here. So like when we're talking about, say if we had a percentage loss and the um, probability, uh, let's say we have a 10% loss, 15% loss or a 20% loss in value. And for here, we have a like 35% probability there, a 10% um, probability there. And then, so that would get us to 45%. So then like a 55% probability there to get our expected probable loss. This would be the more likely outcome uh, here with a probability of 55%. Um, but you could also come up with an expected value this way by doing the cross multiplication and then summing here, just like we did in some of our other expected value type calculations. Okay. Now, um, some things that might indicate that a, an operating unit has lost value would be um, like the macroeconomic conditions worsening. So the broader economy is uh, struggling. So like right now with high inflation, that could potentially be something if you have a business that is really subject to discretionary spending. Um, like when the economy goes down, you'd be disproportionately hit by that. Um, reduced financial performance for some reason, um, changes in customer demand, or a sustained decrease in share price. So if you have a company that is actually, they could have the exact same cash flows now that they had two years ago. But if it's a publicly traded company and their share price used to trade at $10 per share, and now it only trades at $5 per share, and it doesn't look like it's going back up uh, anytime in the near future, that could indicate potential impairment because the market is repricing the value of your company overall. So then you need to go back and look at your goodwill and your assets and be like, okay, what is the market revaluing of our assets here? And the most obvious thing would be goodwill potentially. And that actually happened at a company that I was working at. They had purchased a bunch of different clothing brands and then um, they had overpaid for some of them. And then over time, the cash flows were not coming in the way they wanted. And then their share price went from like $13 a share down to like $3 a share over a few years. And um, so then they finally were like, okay, we gotta, we gotta take an impairment charge against our goodwill because clearly our stock price is not coming back again soon. And they actually ended up going, I was not there then, uh, I had left to teach here, but when COVID hit, uh, they ended up declaring bankruptcy because they're cash, they were struggling so much for cash flows. So, um, and that was like retail, mall retail got just destroyed, you know, for a good year and a half by COVID. Okay, all right. Now, um, what about when we have assets that are going to be sold? So assets that are to be sold, um, if you are actively committed to selling them in their uh, current condition and the sale is probable, um, then that would be considered an asset held for sale. And so that those two things have to be in play. They have to actively be committed to selling them and they have to be like in their present condition without any significant um, investments needing to be made in order to make them more saleable. And then there has to be a, a probab a high probability that they will sell, or at least doesn't necessarily high probability, it has to be probable. So more likely than not, again. Now, um, if the book value is more than the fair value minus the cost of selling, um, then you need to write them down to that fair value minus the cost to sell, which is also referred to as net realizable value. So the amount that you can actually get from something is the net realizable value. So um, fair value is the likely selling price. And then minus um, costs to sell. 
So if you have to pay a realtor to sell your building, you need, and there's transfer taxes and various other things, um, you would subtract those costs of getting it sold from the fair value price that you think you're going to get, and that would give you your net realizable value. All right, and so if your book value is less than what you think you're going to get out of it at the end after you sell it and pay commissions and stuff, then you would just say, all right, we're actively committed to selling this. It's likely that it's going to sell, so we're going to write it down on our books to the what we actually think we will get, get for it, okay? So big example of that would be like the uh, uh, Central High School building, right? That was for sale forever. Um, they originally said, oh, we're going to get like $24 million for this building um, because it's great real estate overlooking the harbor with wonderful views. And it's a large lot right in the middle of prime real estate land. However, it had a building on it that was like had a bad roof and was loaded with asbestos and other environmental contaminants that were very expensive to get rid of. And so um, everybody who came in and started doing due diligence on buying this property was like, oh yeah, never mind. We're not paying that much for it. Like we, when we look at what we can do with this property minus, you know, the costs we have to put in uh, for A, buying it and B, mitigating all of this asbestos and everything, it's just not a good deal. So I think they ended up selling it for like, what, 4 million or 5 million finally this year, like 15 years later. Uh, no, the one up on the hill, like the, the quote unquote new central one, yeah. The, the old central one actually sold for what I think they thought they were gonna get for that one, but they just, uh, yeah, they did not have good luck with that. So at some point they had to have done a market analysis and written down that property like dramatically. I think the highest uh, price they ever got offered for it at one point, um, the Edison Charter Schools offered them like 14 million for it, but they didn't want to sell it to a competitor. So, cause they don't, they didn't want Edison to open a high school and take a bunch of high school students from them. So, um, so instead they sold it for $10 million less. Be interesting to do the revenues on that one. Like, okay, how much do they earn per student per year at approximately what, 1500 students or something potentially that they could have lost? And like, what would be the cash flow stream there? Um, long term, did somebody actually run the numbers on that and make sure that that didn't make sense? But theoretically, you'd think they would. All right, so um, let's see. So this is a summary of different impairment guidelines that are out here. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these, but it kind of summarizes everything that we've talked about all in one slide here. So if you want to go back and review this, this makes a really good cheat sheet. I would recommend that's slide 96 going out and printing that one out could be handy for homework and or exams to just have it all on one sheet. All right, um, and now we're going to talk about how do these impairment losses relate to earnings quality. All right, so when you're working in finance, you have to decide whether um, the losses to these assets are transitory, so aka temporary. Um, or are they part of uh, the permanent earnings um, and cash flows of that company? Okay, so if you're writing off large amounts of assets, that's going to reflect in a huge loss in your financial statements for that year, which makes your numbers look bad, right? Um, in the year that you're writing it off. So somebody who looks in detail at your financial statements can see the difference between operating losses and stuff like this, which would be like other losses, right? Um, or, you know, operating income versus other losses. But when you look at your earnings per share from an investment standpoint, um, a lot of people just look at that earnings per share and maybe aren't digging into it as much. So it does reflect on the company, even though it's not in their operating um, numbers on their financial statements. And then your future earnings theoretically are going to be lower um, because you're going to, you will lower your depreciation, depletion, and amortization, which actually increases your future earnings from that standpoint. But if you have like, you know, your gross income might be lower if you've got an entire segment that goes away. So there's a variety of different effects that will come into play as far as comparability on your future financial statements. 
And so if the company is doing these estimates and they underestimate what their future cash flows are going to be, then they're going to understate the fair value because the fair value is based on the present, the fair value of any asset. Like what is this asset worth today? Is the present value of the discounted future cash flows associated with that asset, right? Like the time value of money, present value of everything that you expect to generate over time. And so if you underestimate how much you're gonna earn over time, then the present value that you estimate will also be underestimated, right? Now, if you are understating that value, A, your current year income is gonna be unrealistically low because you're gonna have that impairment loss hitting your net income. And then also your future income um, might seem unrealistically high um, because you're understating your asset values with that you're going to be depreciating. All right. Um, what happens if we spend money on something after we buy it? Okay. So we, we've talked about initial purchases in last chapter, right? Uh, now we're going to talk about what happens if we are making upgrades. We spend more on something. So if... Lots of uh, equipment that you have, buildings, et cetera, they're gonna require work over time. Your building's not gonna last forever. It's gonna need a new roof. Maybe it needs electrical upgrades. Um, if you have a brick building, it's gonna need tuck pointing and all that fun stuff at some point down the line. Um, so they're good. And these are referred to as improvements if they are long-term um, increases to the value and functionality of the assets. And so if it's expected to provide benefits beyond the current year, so it's not just like lubricating the machines or you know, tweaking them for performance or whatever, then we would capitalize it. So the key there being it's going to increase the long-term, either the long-term life or improve the operation of that asset beyond one year. And then in that case, we would capitalize it and we would depreciate those improvements. Now, if you are spending something to just maintain a current level of operability, then it, you would expense it. So if it's not going to improve how well it's operating, it gets expensed because that's considered just maintenance. But if it improves the um, functionality or the life, then it would be capitalized. Okay, so increasing the assets book value and or creating a new asset gets capitalized. Uh, maintaining a given level of performance would be expensing, typically. Now, um, future benefits that you would want to consider, so it would be, okay, does it lengthen the life? Does it increase the efficiency? Um, does it decrease future operating costs? Or does it increase the quality of the goods that you're producing with it? Okay, so there has to be some measurable improvement in one of those ways beyond just the one year mark. All right, and so what would be considered material, right? So this concept of materiality means that we only record stuff if it's big enough. We only capitalize something or look at it long term if it's big enough that it would change somebody's decision making in the long term. And so a lot of times companies will set what's called a, a threshold for whether they're going to capitalize something. So technically, a stapler can be used for many years, right? Have you ever purchased a stapler? Okay, I've purchased a couple of staplers over my lifetime, maybe like two. I've been out of college for more than one decade. We'll just say that. We'll put it that way, more than one decade. And during that time, I think I have purchased perhaps two staplers. And I can certainly tell you that the second one was only purchased because I was unable to locate the first one, not because it stopped working, right? So that stapler that I purchased is clearly good for more than one year. I would not capital, I would not recommend any company capitalize a stapler. Why do you think that would be? It just wouldn't, like it wouldn't have enough revenue. Right. How much does a stapler cost? Like you could buy it, you could probably buy a cheap stapler for five bucks if you want to go really fancy and buy yourself a red swing line stapler like the dude from Office Space. You could probably break out like 20 bucks for a stapler that you could 
you know, like use as a bludgeon if you wanted to, you know, your, your two pound metal swing line stapler, right? For 20 bucks. It would definitely cost you more than $20 in somebody's time to depreciate that stupid stapler. And if you had a whole bunch of those staplers, you could have somebody spend a whole bunch of time um, depreciating all those ridiculously cheap staplers, but it doesn't make sense, right? So that's where this capitalization threshold comes in. Um, there's a lot of small electronics you can buy, like, um, like flash drives, things like that, um, that are under $100. And um, they're important to keep track of because they're useful and you don't want your data disappearing. But at the end of the day, it's not really worth tracking even a $100 asset. So a lot of companies will set like a $250 or a $500 capitalization threshold. Um, here they're saying $1,000, also not at all unlikely, um, because just frankly, under that amount, it's, you know, it becomes something where, okay, we're probably going to write this off for tax purposes. So from that standpoint, we don't even want to bother keeping track of it. And then, um, you know, just small electronics and things you'd have around your office that tend to maybe float away and tra keeping track of them might even be more work than, um, than just expensing them, right? So, um, this can qualify, you could put this threshold for repairs and maintenance, you could put it for new asset additions, improvements to old assets, uh, rearrangements of assets from like one business unit or one location to another uh, location, things like that. And you could apply that threshold and just be like, dude, I'm not dealing with this, just expense it and be done with it. Okay, it's not worth my time. All right, so for repairs and maintenance, um, typically that involves maintaining a given level of benefits and does not increase future benefits. So things that you would be writing off um, that would be below your threshold and or that are just maintaining would just go to repairs and maintenance. And then um, they would be expensed in the period that they were incurred. So, all right, I spent $500 to get some new parts put into this piece of equipment because uh, it was starting to get a little you know, maybe it wasn't as precise as it was supposed to be, but performance is starting to get a little sketchy. So we'll replace these parts to maintain current performance levels, right? So we would expense that in repairs and maintenance. Um, engine tune-ups, maintenance, oil changes, things like that would all be included in there. Now, what about, um, as far as looking at additions, Having a new component for an existing asset could be capitalized because you would potentially be increasing your future benefits. Um, so like if you had a delivery truck and you added refrigeration to it, that would potentially um, be an addition to a truck that would uh, add additional future benefits. You could use it for more things if it had the ability to have refrigeration. Or if it had refrigeration that's that no longer worked and you ripped out the current refrigeration unit and put in a new refrigeration unit, the new refrigeration unit is likely to last significantly longer than whatever old unit you had in there. Even if the one that you have is still working, if it maybe had like less than a year expected life left on it, or you're having to do a lot of maintenance to keep it going, if you rip it out and put in a new one that's... Um, you know, does exactly the same thing, but it's newer and therefore it's going to have a longer life, um, then that would be capitalized. Okay. Now, um, improvements would be um, replacing potentially, oh, so I talked about an asset. So addition would be like if you were adding in a new one, improvement would be ripping out the old one and putting a new one, sorry. Um, if you are replacing an old component with a new one that does the same thing, or if you are putting in a new one that is slightly better, then that would also be considered an improvement. And that would also be capitalized. All right. Now, um, when you are looking at the cost of your improvements, um, you could either like substitute one asset for the other. So like you would maybe dispose of the old unit if it didn't work and then capitalize the new one. 
Um, if you are getting rid of an or scrapping an old unit or selling it, then of course you need to go back to that sale component where you remove both the asset and the accumulated depreciation off the books and recognize if it's if you're scrapping it, you probably recognize a loss if it's not fully depreciated. Or if you're selling it, you could have either a gain or a loss. All right. So this is just talking about, okay, substitution, dispose of the old component and acquire the new one. Capitalization of a new cost would be like you just bought something new. And then um, reduction of accumulated depreciation, you could leave something in your assets, but um, just show it as being fully um, depreciated if you still have the asset um, on hand but aren't using it any longer. All right, so these are just more in-depth examples of those, but I think that you guys probably understand. Basically, um, you know, when you're purchasing something, you're gonna debit the asset account, credit whatever payment method you use, whether it's cash or a loan. Um, so nothing really new here. It's just mentioning that these are possibilities and kind of equating them in how we, how we did things before. Okay. Now, um, here's an, oops, sorry, here's a good one though. I will mention the journal entry for. We've got uh, a company replacing an air conditioning system that they lease to tenants. The old air conditioning system is included in the cost of the building, uh, but the company separately depreciated the air conditioning system. Um, so, Depreciation recorded up to the date of replacement totaled 160,000, which would mean that we would have had um, approximately $40,000 in um, unrecovered accumulated or unrecovered depreciation costs. And they, they removed the old system, installed a new system at a cost of $230,000. And they used some parts from the old system that they sold for 12,000. So here, what they did was they, um, basically because that building or the depreciation was for the old unit was in here, they basically removed depreciation for the amount of the net of the cost minus the sales of the parts, which was the 218,000. So that's another method that you could do. All right. And... Let's see, rearrangement of an asset would be where you restructure the asset without actually adding, replacing, or improving anything. Um, using, finding a new capability for it, but it doesn't necessarily lengthen the asset's life. So like if you rearranged your machinery on your production line to increase your efficiency, like maybe there was some manual step that was having to happen because you had a machine over way over on one side and way over on the other, but if you put them next to each other, then um, you can make the process of moving things from one to the other more efficient, things like that. Um, so the costs associated with that rearrangement. So it's probably not, if you have a huge piece of like manufacturing equipment, you're gonna need like a crane or something. You're gonna need employee time. You're gonna have downtime and things like that. So you could potentially capitalize the costs of that rearrangement. Now, if and you would only capitalize those if, again, if they're material, so if they would make a difference or if they meet your um, capitalization threshold, if they are not material or if you're not sure of what the benefits will be, like maybe you're just moving some stuff because you needed room for something else to be put in and you're not sure if that there will be any benefit to it, then you would just write off the cost and expense it. All right, and then this slide on 112 is a summary of all of these things we just talked about. Um, so that was the other one was 96, so 96 and 112, both good study slides for you. All right, now what about if you have intangibles, so thinking like um, trademarks or patents, and you have costs of defending those in court. So litigation costs, those would be capitalized um, over the remaining useful life of whatever was being defended. So like if you were defending a patent in court, 
um, because one of your competitors tried to say that it was like not novel and it was like imposing on trade in the broader um, market or whatever. You go to court, you spend, you know, $100,000 defending this patent um, and your patent has five years of useful life left in it. If you're successful in defending that patent, then you would um, add that cost to your patent account on your balance sheet and you would amortize it over that remaining five years of life of the patent, okay? If it is unsuccessfully defended, then you just expense the costs because you don't have anything to defend at that point. You're kind of just, <laughs> you're, you're out of luck. <laughs> and then also, if you are unsuccessful in defending that, then you need to um, look at that asset, determine what the impairment level is, and then write that asset down to its new um, realizable value. Okay, so let me just check what we've got. We've got to be getting really close to the end here. I want to say it was 22. So we've got retirement and replacement here. All right, and then, okay, so let's look at problem 14. So this is our last in-class exercise. We've got Demert Manufacturing. They incurred the following expenditures during the current fiscal year. And how should we account for each of these expenditures? All right, so we've got annual maintenance on equipment of $5,400. How are we going to classify this? Our, our uh, options are addition, improvement, normal repairs and maintenance, or Rearrangement. Normal repairs and maintenance. Yep, just normal uh, repairs and maintenance. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to expense those in the period in which they are incurred. All right. Uh, what about remodeling of offices for $22,000? Would that be addition, improvement, or rearrangement? That's going to be an improvement, yeah. Um, and then that one would then be capitalized and depreciated, right? And then we can use either our substitution method, like if we had old remodeling charges out there, which are obviously no longer applicable, uh, we could get rid of those charges, write those ones off, and then record the new remodeling cost. Um, or we could just directly capitalize it if we didn't have any previous ones at all. Um, or we could do the reduction of accumulated depreciation method. So like if we had, um, we would um, debit our accumulated depreciation for the uh, difference in cost between what it costs us for the remodeling minus any benefits we might've had from selling off old office stuff or whatever. Okay, um, now we've got rearrangement of the shipping and receiving area resulting in an increase in productivity for $35,000. What would that one be? Rearrangement. Rearrangement. All right, and that would again be what? Capitalized, yep. Um, now, if they had rearranged that and they didn't think they were going to get an increase in productivity, maybe they just rearranged it because they were trying to make room for something else, potentially that would just be expense then, okay? So the key part there is that it resulted in the increase in productivity. Um, last one here, we've got addition of a security system. What do you think that's gonna be? And that was 25,000. Yeah, that's going to be an addition, and then that's going to be also capitalized and depreciated. Okay. All right, so we're on the home stretch here then. Um, last couple things to talk about here. Um, looking at makers, all right? So makers is a tax depreciation method. Um, it is, it's relatively close to the double declining balance method, um, the modified accelerated cost recovery system. And um, that is a method that is used for um, 
um, typically taxes, but if you're using it for financial reporting purposes, um, you could potentially use that for your book depreciation method as well. Um, basically, you just need to say when you are doing your depreciation that you have a systematic and rational predictable method for how you're doing your depreciation. Okay, that's the whole point for financial reporting purposes. Um, um, for income tax purposes, though, basically it gets influenced by what the government is trying to accomplish. All right. So things like uh, bonus depreciation in Section 199, where you can expense certain assets immediately, um, are motivated by things other than accurate financial reporting. Okay. And so the maker's system was set up by the tax code, and um, it's only for assets that were acquired after 1986. You pick a recovery category, which is like three years, five years, seven years, et cetera, and then you depreciate them. Um, they say three, five, seven, 10, 15, and 20 years for personal property, and then real estate has um, 27 and a half, um, and then... Um, 30 something. And the big difference is that the useful lives and residual values are not used in makers. You basically just write something off under makers. Um, so you have much different um, ability to look at the lives of assets under financial statement reporting based on what you qualitatively think the life of that asset will be and how long you plan to use it. Whereas under makers, certain types of assets have certain classes and certain numbers of years over which they must be depreciated. So like furniture and fixtures are five-year assets, regardless of how long you plan to use them um, under makers. And um, like trucks and machinery are typically seven-year assets under makers. Um, Computers and um, electronics and stuff are typically three-year assets, regardless of how long you're planning on using them. So, in some ways, makers is a little is more rigid than what um, what you have to use for financial reporting because the tax code they don't want you voluntarily putting shorter lives on stuff for tax purposes because they don't want you to just expense everything up front, write your money down to zero or write your income down to zero and then um, not pay any taxes. And then of course, then they come up with methods where they actually let you do exactly that that are separate from depreciation, which has gotten sort of out of control in my opinion over the last like 15 years, like bonus depreciation was implemented after the economic crash in like the 2008, 2009. And um, it was meant to be like something that was available for two years. And then it just became, oh, we do this every year. You can just write off half of your stuff or all of your stuff, regardless of what it is. And so. Um, you said you're outside with that. Yeah, because for tax purposes, it's just like, it's not accurately reflecting how long people are using stuff. It's allowing tax avoidance. It encourages people to like buy things um, like faster. So, I mean, it's, it's, they did it to stimulate the economy. And when the economy needed stimulating, that was great. Now we're in a period of high inflation where the economy is clearly overstimulated and we have 100% bonus depreciation. So that's like the opposite of what the goal should be from a, um, governmental influence standpoint. So do you still feel the same if uh, a business versus like an individual does it? Or do you just... Well, individuals don't get tax deductions for all the stuff that they buy for the most part. Like this is from a depreciation standpoint. Like they're going to expense it over time anyway, but they're not, they're expensing it all up front and taking their income down to zero instead of, I mean, and you could make the argument, well, then they would have higher income later, but then what they do is then they buy stuff faster in order to continue getting those deductions. So, I mean, it accomplishes the goal of in encouraging businesses to purchase new assets sooner by providing them with those tax benefits. But anyway, that's sort of beyond the scope of this class and that's a more of a tax class. I could get it, that's a long discussion. <laughs> but, um, 
Anyway, um, firms can't choose what methods they basically use makers or section 179 or bonus depreciation under taxes. And, um, and then they have, they default to a half year um, recovery the first year. Let's see here. I'm not gonna get into this too much because makers has been discussed. Uh, everybody here I think has taken financial management already. Um, and you've definitely had makers in both your financial and your um, uh, managerial accounting classes also. So I'm going to kind of skip past that. But here they're talking about bonus depreciation where you can basically, for qualified assets, deduct whatever percentage is the allowable bonus depreciation percentage. At various years, it's ranged between 50%, 80%, 100% bonus depreciation um, and then, <laughs> and bonus depreciation is out there now until 2027. So it's going 60, 40, 20, assuming that Congress doesn't re-up that again. Now, um, when you are uh, uh, looking at retiring your assets, um, You would write up the asset accounts for any additional expenditures that would be required. And then when you dispose of it, you would remove the asset completely from its account um, and then take your gain or loss. And then depreciation expense gets recorded up to the point that you dispose of it. So you need to make sure that before you record your disposals, you record the depreciation first and then record the disposal, which we, I think I talked about that earlier in the chapter. And then you would record the actual sale. So here we've got um, purchase of 100 handheld calculators at $50 each, debit calculators, credit cash. Um, and then they purchased 20 more calculators at $45, debit and calculators, credit and cash. And then they disposed of 30 calculators by selling them to a bookkeeping firm. You debit cash, and then you would need to um, credit the calculators that you sold. Um, and then you would need to debit the depreciation expense to remove it from the books, which um, we already talked about that. Let's see, as far as replacing it, um, again, make sure all of your depreciation is recorded up until the time that you replace the asset and then you would make your entry to remove the asset and its accumulated depreciation from the books. So, and, and that's it, that's the chapter. So um, that wraps us up for the course. Um, your exam, your final exam will be due by the end of the day on Tuesday. I have a bunch of sample problems that are posted out into um, uh, connect for you. And I can't emphasize enough how much reviewing those questions will help you. There are questions in there that are literally the exact same questions with different numbers um, to help give you an idea of, you know, or maybe like a very similar question with a different company name kind of thing. Like go out and study those because they're free information on exactly what will be on the exam. So you won't run into any surprises. You won't run into any, oh, I thought it meant this or and it really meant that. Um, so use those study questions to your advantage. Um, I, I do those in basically all my classes and I, I can see who studies them and who doesn't study them. And I can tell you there's definitely a difference between the people who, regardless of like what the homework people have done or whatever, if they review the study questions, they do better on the exams. So use them. Um, um, use the tool that's out there for you. Um, anyone have any questions? Anyone online or in person have any questions before we wrap up? I have a word question. But okay, you can, yeah, you can ask that after. Um, and then if you have any late items, they, those need to be turned in by Sunday. So make sure if you have any past due items you forgot to do, get those in. I won't accept them after Sunday. So thank you, everybody. Um, I hope you guys are all dug out, even though you weren't able to make it to campus today. And I hope you have a lovely holiday break. Bye, everybody. Yeah.